to, and we'll get to all of it, but want to start off by hitting the phones. Johnny and Waco joining us here on Extra Innings at 877-881-1053. Hey, Johnny. Hey, I love your show, and I love what y'all do. Hey, I had a real quick question. I found a website that I can watch the Rangers. We can't get Valley Sports down here. Can I give the website or not? Uh, no, you can if it's Fubo, you can. But if not, then I we're gonna dump it. So okay, can, we well, can't I promote won't... anything illegal, unfortunately. Okay, okay. But anyway, but no, I love the I love what y'all are doing. Uh, my uh, main uh, question was: so Justin Foskey. I haven't seen him play a whole lot. I know it's limited what he can do. And uh, Wenzel, are any of them going to be going back down? Or what's the update on uh, Nate Lowe? That's all I got for you. I love what y'all do. I appreciate it. Appreciate it, Johnny. Yeah, uh, and just as a quick aside, if you're out of market, you can stream the games on MLB.tv. But uh, there's also, for those in market, uh, and I tweeted this the other day, I believe, there's a, a promotion uh, through Fubo that you can uh, take advantage of, and I believe that uh, gives you access as well. Uh, so, all right, Justin Foskey on the 60-day IL. You're not going to see him anytime soon. Davis Wenzel is up here for the time being. Uh, you know, I don't know that he's going to get uh, a ton of playing time necessarily beyond his role, which is to face lefties, but he's here, and you'll see him... Uh, you know, he is yet to get that first big league hit, but you know, I'm sure he'll get some opportunities. The, the Rangers will obviously face some lefties uh, here over the next week as they continue their road trip. They won't face a lefty tomorrow, and the Astros in general are a pretty right-handed dominant team. Uh, they're only lefty in the bullpen now that they sent Parker Mashinsky back down as Josh Hader, uh, and then tomorrow's starter is uh, a righty and Christian Javier. But uh, yeah, you'll see Davis Wenzel, but he's not here to be a you know an everyday player. He's here to be a, a backup. You know, sometimes you call a guy up like Evan Carter last year with the expectation that this guy's going to play pretty much every day. Uh, sometimes you call a guy up like Davis Wenzel with the expectation of he's got a very specific role and he'll play uh, within that role. And if he earns opportunities outside of it, all right. But uh, he's got to earn those opportunities first. They're not just going to be given to him. And this is a big difference when you are a winning team versus uh, a team in a developmental rebuild stage, right? Three years ago, if the Rangers call up Davis Wenzel, they're only doing it if he's going to play every day. Uh, otherwise, they'll probably fill the, the hole with some veteran whose development they don't care about. And it's not that they don't care about Davis Wenzel's development. It's just simply that, you know, at this point in his career and also kind of merged with where the Rangers are, you know, they need Davis Wenzel to fill this role. Like he is, he is the potentially the best candidate to fill the role. It's a, a credit to him. He's not getting handed this opportunity or wasn't handed the opportunity just because he's young and has some potential. He was handed this opportunity because he earned it, because the Rangers believe he is the best person for this role. Uh, but that role is is pretty specific right now. Maybe late game defense, well, in a, a, a game that's decided by several runs, maybe you get a pinch hit opportunity. Uh, but for the most part, he's going to be in the lineup when there's a lefty starter maybe pinch hit against a lefty reliever and against a lefty starter. If the game is close uh, late in the game and a righty comes in out of the pen, he very well might be, uh, you know, a pinch hit uh, replacement. So that's kind of his role. As far as Nate Lowe, he's, he's still, you know, probably a week away. He's going to play in his second rehab appearance tonight. He's actually oddly going up against Justin Verlander. Who's making what, is likely his final rehab appearance for the Astros before they bring him back up to their rotation. Uh, but you know, Nathaniel Lowe didn't really have much of a spring training, so uh, this is kind of that for him. So it's not going to be a you know two to three game rehab assignment like it might be if we were mid season and he had already had you know a, a, a stable of at bats. This is probably going to be a thirty to forty at bat type of rehab for for Nathaniel. So. I guess it's possible he joins the team at the very end of the road trip when they're in Atlanta. I know that would be really neat for him uh, with his Georgia ties. That is possible. I think it's more likely that he joins the team uh, after the off day on Monday the 22nd uh, and then returns for the homestand. And as far as what the Rangers are going to do, you know, Jared Walsh got off to a nice start, and I don't want to overreact because it's small sample. If he goes three for four tomorrow, then the numbers are going to change. He's hitting 250. He's getting on base 33% of the time, but not a whole lot of slug. He's got a sub-700 OPS. He does play good defense, but 
Uh, the strikeout numbers are high. I don't know what the Rangers are going to do with Jared Walsh. Nathaniel Lowe is going to be this team's starting first baseman. I don't have any doubts about that. I just I think the Rangers would love to keep Jared Walsh around if they can. I just don't know what they're going to do in order to do that because Jared Walsh and Nathaniel Lowe are both left-handed hitting first baseman, and it's going to be tough to roster both of them because neither guy has any sort of utility ability. Jared Walsh can play right field, but you don't need another left-handed hitting outfielder off the bench. You've already got Travis Jankowski uh, who fills that spot. So I don't know what it would be, and the next week could certainly change the conversation. A really, really bad week from Jared Walsh might make it easier for the Rangers to say goodbye. A really, really good week might totally change the conversation in a different way. But one thing that I'm I'm sure of is that when Nathaniel Lowe comes back, he's going to be this team's starting first baseman. Uh, 877-881-1053, 877-881-1053. Uh, we'll get to another call. Then I want to talk about Andrew Heaney and the bullpen. Let's go to Luis and Laredo joining us here on Extra Innings, brought to you by our friends at Uber Eats. Hey, Luis. Hey, Jared. Thanks for taking my call, as always. Uh, um, you know, I um, it just baffles me. I see a lot of similarities uh, with the with the – with the way the team's playing whenever Josh Young goes out. For whatever reason, I don't know what it is, but it's not the same team offensively. And it's it's very apparent. I've seen a big enough sample size. I would like to get your take on it. I am, though, going to see the positive things that overall, which is that they can still win the series tomorrow with, with Nate at the, on the mound. You mentioned Nate Lowe. He's coming back. Uh, should be in about the next two weeks. It will be an upgrade from Jared Walsh, who's a good player. I know he started out, you know, uh, smoking, but he's kind of fell off a little bit, and he's not anywhere near as good as Nate. So I do, to answer your question, my prediction is that they're going to designate him for assignment. Uh, you know, I, it's nothing, you know, nothing wrong with that. But like you said, you cannot keep him at the expense of Jankowski or or even Duran. And I just don't know how you have a spot for him. Uh, Lorenzen comes back, you know, now which should spell the end of Andrew Heaney. I would like to think that, but I do think that Andrew could be a good reliever and a two inning hold guy. Uh, Scherzer comes back next month. Jack Leiter's still killing it down there. Um, and they're still at the top of the division. And you mentioned during the broadcast how they're at the top, I think, with Atlanta and the Dodgers uh, as far as their uh, amount of runs and scoring. And that's with Seager still not hitting and, and the team not slugging as we're accustomed to. I do see Carter and Langford getting better. Carter's there. And Langford just needs that first homer, and I think they're going to come in bunches after that. You guys have a good weekend and look forward to tomorrow's broadcast. I appreciate Luis. Uh Appreciate the call. Appreciate the, the the assessment. I agree with everything but the young thing. Uh, I, I couldn't disagree more with that. Uh, without young, the Rangers are averaging around five runs per game. Uh, and unless you believe that young's absence is the sole reason that a number of guys just aren't off to great starts, which started before young got hurt, then I don't know how you can make that correlation. Uh, when Josh Young got Hurt last year, the combination of Duran and Smith hit 150. They hit 150 at third base. Uh, Josh Smith, since Josh Young got hurt, if you look at his numbers, including what he did today, uh, and and yes, he has not started every game at third. He's just about started every game at third. He's hitting 320 with an 800 plus OPS. So uh, the Rangers are eight and seven, and they've got one of the best lineups in in baseball. And and Luis, you you recognize that, right? third in the majors and runs per game, a bulk of that has come without Josh Young. So Josh Young's a really good player. There's no doubt about it. But in baseball, one player is not going to derail anything. Uh, and as a matter of fact, let's just look at this very simply. I've talked about this with the Rangers. Corey Seager went down last year. They did really well. Why? Because guys stepped up and performed well. And you can't tell me that Josh Young is going to have more of an impact on guys around him than Corey Seager. You can't tell me that Josh Young's individual impact in a vacuum is greater than that of the guy who is the second best offensive player uh, in Major League Baseball last year. Uh, and then let's just take Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani won the MVP. He was amazing. And the Angels were nowhere near a playoff team last season. So if Shohei Otani can't have that much of an impact uh, on a team, then you can't tell me that Josh Young's absence uh, is going to have that much of an impact. Again, you got to look at last year. Yes, Luis is correct. 
the Rangers struggled when Josh Young was out. But it wasn't just that Josh Young was out. It was that they got no production from third. It's that during that time, they dealt with injuries to other all-star players, and their bullpen was totally in shambles. Right? Like, worse, you, you think today's worse, and if you're, you know, what have you done for me lately person, you probably feel like this is the worst bullpen ever because the bullpen wasn't great today. The bullpen this year so far compared to last year doesn't even compare. Right? So, I, uh, the Rangers are 8-7. and seven. And their offense has been fine. Josh Young's absence, uh, while he is a very good player, he is an all-star caliber player and a very important player for this team. Uh, the Rangers are not struggling because of Josh Young's absence. And I'll tell you this, if they are struggling because of Josh Young's absence, this team has no hope. This team does not stand a chance over a 162-game season if the absence of one guy uh, is going to create an issue. Uh, I think we got. Oh, do is is this same? We have another Luis. Is the same Luis? Different Luis. Okay, uh, different Luis. I'm going to have you hang tight. Oh, all right. Well, then the person in front of different Luis hung up. We're going to go to different Luis. Who's in? Is he in Puerto Rico? All right, Luis in yes, Puerto sir. Rico. What's going on, man? Hey, hey, uh, Jared, first of all, I love what you guys do at the show. Um, you know, Rangers fan from Puerto Rico. I'm actually flying to Dallas uh, for the 4 of July game against the Padres, so I'm excited for that and see my Rangers play. Love it. Hey, Jared, so I, have a, I have a question. You know, uh, with the way Josh Smith has been playing lately, uh, you know, he's been a great part of, of the offense lately and the team, you know, uh, coming up big, like no one thought Josh Smith will be hitting fifth in the Rangers lineup. Um what do you think the Rangers will do when Josh Young comes back? Like, how do you keep Josh Smith in the lineup uh, when Young is ready? Because the way he's hitting right now, if he keeps hitting the way he is, uh, he's going to be in the lineup, you know, in one way or the other. What do you think are the options for Bruce Boshi when Josh Young comes back for Josh Smith? Yeah, so that's a great question, Luis. And I'll, I'll tell you, one thing that Josh Young provides Bruce Bochy is options because he can play first, or sorry, second, third, short, and left field. Uh, and so there are a number of ways you can get him in the lineup. It's tough to have that conversation right now because Josh Smith is still, you know, around two months away from returning. Or sorry, Josh Young is around two months away from returning, maybe a little bit sooner than that. Uh, but the 60-day IL will will keep him out, you know, for a minimum of two months from the injury. Uh, so that gets you to the very beginning of June. And the reality is it's April 13th, and so much can change between now and then. Josh Smith can level out and be hitting 220 at that point. Or Josh Smith can you know, still be hitting at a high enough level where you're like, hey, we got to keep this guy in the lineup, right? So that's first, uh, you know, to Luis's question. It could, it could regress it could stabilize or it could maintain uh and i i definitely feel like you know there, there's a really good chance that come early june josh smith is going to be a guy that we'd like to see in the lineup now he's not going to you know in easy ways probably not going to play against lefties right but uh who's healthy who's who's available uh who's playing well who's not playing well i'll give you a quick example it's it's still early, and so the same thing applies to this guy that applies to Josh Smith, but Leody Tavares. Leody Tavares isn't you know, necessarily tearing the cover off the ball at all, and it's not fair to say that someone's got to get off to a good start because it's a 162-game season, but you know, there is a little bit of pressure and, and question about Leody Tavares when the season started. He's got a 557 OPS. Yeah, he's doing a nice job drawing walks, but he's hitting under 200, and he's not really slugging. Now, could he easily turn it around? Absolutely. It's a 13-game stretch, and he's currently mired in a uh, an 0-for-11 slump. So this early in the season, if you've got an 0-for-11, your numbers are going to probably be weighted in, in you know, a negative light. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it's it's fair to say that Leody Tavares and, say, Evan Carter are, are perceived differently, right? Uh, and Evan Carter's earned that. Uh, so if Evan Carter were to get off to this sort of a start, you're just like, no, nah, not a big deal. Leody Tavares gets off to the start. You start wondering, well, how much longer is he going to be an everyday guy? And so I say all that to say this, not that Leody Tavares couldn't turn it around, just like, you know, Josh Smith 
and, and his season can go in all sorts of directions still. But what if Laody Tavares doesn't turn it around? Well, right there, that's an opportunity because now maybe you've got Evan Carter in center and you have White Langford in left and Josh Smith can DH or White Langford DHs, Josh Smith's in left or Adolis Garcia DHs and, you know, maybe you put uh, Josh Smith in right or Evan Carter in right and Josh Smith in center. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot. If Josh Smith is hitting, he's going to play. We've talked about this before. If you got a, a big league ball player who is really good defensively, but just is not that great offensively, that guy is either on the bench or in AAA. And by the way, that was Josh Smith last year. If you've got a guy who is a really, really good hitter, but can't play a lick of defense, he's an everyday player on 30 MLB teams. They find a way. Josh Smith is a really good defensive player. That's not going to change. But if Josh Smith is hitting, they'll find a way to get him in the lineup. In a perfect world where everyone is healthy, then Josh Smith might move back to a bench role of some kind if Laody Tavares is producing. Otherwise, there you go. That's your opening. The reality is we don't live in a perfect world. Someone, unfortunately, will probably get hurt. Someone might not be performing. If Josh Smith is healthy and performing, that will inform them of how they're going to find ways to get him in the lineup. If he was two days away, if Josh Young was two days away from returning, what I would tell you is what I just mentioned, that Laody Tavares might be losing playing time in favor of Josh Smith indirectly. Uh, but because we're not two days away, we're two months away, it's just tougher to know exactly the route they're going to take. Colton and Fora, and thanks for the call, Luis, and appreciate uh, the fandom all the way from Puerto Rico. That's awesome. Colton in Fort Worth, 877-881-1053. What's going on, Colton? First of all, how are you doing, guys? We're good, man. What do you got for us? So I've been watching the Rangers game, and what quest, what concerns me is the the bullpen, of course, and some of the starters like Andrew Heaney and a couple of the others. Like Cody Bradford has been doing good. Nathan Valdi's killing it. But the, so I'd be like, should we what other? St- like just Cole? curious. Yeah, just curious, Cole. What other starters have concerned you? Um, and oh, God, I can't really think right now. I just got off of work. It's probably just. But, I'm just, I'm asking that because it's probably. Just he. I mean, he's the one who's, you know, unless John Gray is, maybe John Gray, but the Rangers starting rotation ERA entering today was sixth best in Major League Baseball, just as a, for whatever it's worth. Oh, really? See, I I just really, I've watched all the games, and Andrew Heaney, where he's pitched most of the time, has concerned me. Uh, and then, especially the bullpen. Bullpen, when we get late in the games, and it's like close games, they concern me when they give up a lot of runs. So is this the same like last year, last year's or this bullpen better? Yeah, I, I appreciate the call, Colton. And and the Andrew Heaney concern is fair. I just I want to be sure to to not misinform and, and suggest this rotation has struggled. As far as the bullpen, uh, let let's not forget last year's bullpen was historically bad. Like. We're not talking about, oh, there's a bullpen like that every year bad. We're talking about whether it's just playoff teams or the rest of the league, like historically bad. There are bad teams who don't really care to have a good bullpen because they trade away all their good relievers and they just as well may you know lose games so they can get a better pick. They had better bullpens than the Rangers, right? So let's not forget that bullpen and let's not yet even begin to try and compare this bullpen to that bullpen. The Rangers bullpen ERA entering today was three, six, five. Now it's obviously bumped up a bit, but the Rangers bullpen is a middle of the pack unit. And I would tell you that that's probably a fair representation of, of who and what they are. They could be a slightly above average bullpen. If you know, Kirby Yates and David Robertson have really good years. Like they've, had so far uh, they could be a really good bullpen if they can you know get Jose Leclerc going in the right direction they can be a slightly below average bullpen as well they're going to be in a position to make acquisitions and upgrades like they did last year uh, and who knows what happens with Michael Lorenzen added to the rotation maybe Andrew Heaney goes to the bullpen and starts to pitch well and maybe he finds a, a bit of a home there the Rangers bullpen as of now 
is not even in the same stratosphere of bad as last year's bullpen. Now, I'll say this. Last year's bullpen at this point in the season was not thought of as a bullpen that was going to be as bad as it ended up being. But I just, I look at the the options the Rangers have, uh, and I would be surprised if we are talking about that bullpen in the same context. Now, one thing that we all need to remember here, when your bullpen has a bad game, you feel like your bullpen sucks. And you sometimes forget that other bullpens have bad games too from time to time, right? So let's not forget to just, it's not a bad practice and it's a little tougher to do here in mid April, but it's not a bad practice to sometimes if you, if you know how to navigate some of these statistical databases like fan graphs, baseball reference, the stuff that's publicly available to just take a look and see, Hey, how, what's the Rangers bullpen ERA compared to the rest of the league? Or what are I feel like their offense is struggling. What, what is their, what, what are their offensive numbers compared to the rest of the league? Uh, or man, I, I, I feel like, you know, this is going really well. How does it compare to the rest? Of, and it, it will give you a good idea. And it, it, it helps remind you that there are 29 other teams and 29 other teams uh, have strengths and weaknesses just like you do. Uh, so, for instance, I was, I was tweeting with someone earlier, and understandably, he was talking about how this, this lineup is so inconsistent. Well, a few things. One, it feels that way because they just had a stretch where they – had a, a, a three out of four game sequence in which the bats were non-existent. And the fact that it happened against the A's probably doesn't help. But then let's take a step back. All right. First of all, they are by pretty much every relevant offensive measure, no worse than top three in major league baseball, including the most important one, which is runs per game. All right. So maybe if you want them to be consistently average, that's fine. Maybe if, if you'd rather them be consistent, but at, a, at an average level, I, I don't think you'd want that. But then here's the thing. All right, so you think they've been really inconsistent. There are only five teams that have had uh, fewer games of three runs or less than the Rangers. So what that tells me is that it feels like they're inconsistent, but realize that if they are, then inconsistency is just at an all-time high around the league because there are 24 teams that have had more games of three or fewer runs than the Rangers. Now, maybe some of those teams, like, say, the Marlins, are just consistently bad, but I don't think you would take a consistently bad lineup over an inconsistent lineup if that's what you believe it is. My point in saying this is that, first of all, let's not complain about the Rangers lineup when they haven't gotten great production yet or production that is on par with realistic expectation from Simeon, Seeger, Carter, Langford, Heim, and then no Young. Yet they're still one of the best lineups in baseball. But my point in saying that is to use another example of, you know, it might feel at times like this group of the team is really bad. And maybe they are. They're, they're, maybe, maybe at times they are. I'm not saying that they, you know, the Rangers are perfect, but one thing to help maybe get you out of the, the tunnel vision of following only your team is to, to take a look at those league numbers, right? And in baseball, it's tough to follow the whole league unless you're just a junkie and you're watching MLB Network all day long and listening to podcasts because your team is probably playing at the exact same time as every other team and you're only able to watch two teams during that window, right? Your team and the team that your team's playing. So it's understandable that a lot of times this happens in baseball conversations where you're a prisoner of the moment. The moment today is that the Rangers did not get a good performance from their starter nor their bullpen. And you it's tough to sometimes grasp, especially after a game like this, that oh, other teams can't have it this bad. But no, they do. They have games like this, including, by the way, the team that you just lost to. The Astros are in way worse shape. Now, I want to get to Colton's point about Andrew Heaney here, and then we'll get back to the phones. I do think Andrew Heaney is going to go to the bullpen. Or I'll say this about Andrew Heaney. Uh, his velocity's down. I, I don't want to make any assumptions. All I will tell you is that there are times when a guy's velocity is down nearly two miles an hour where maybe they're pitching through something. And if Andrew Heaney is pitching through something, I wonder if the, the arrival of Michael Lorenzen will allow the Rangers and Andrew Heaney to feel comfortable sitting him down for a couple weeks and getting whatever that is right, if that is the case. 
he might be totally healthy, right? But maybe it's something mechanical. I, I don't know. He might be totally healthy. I'm just saying, when a guy's velocity is down a couple miles an hour, you usually at least have to ask the question. Either way, I do think that Andrew Heaney can be a valuable bullpen arm because he can give you multiple innings. He can also be a guy who gets lefties out, and he is effective left-on-left left typically. Uh, and maybe that allows his stuff to tick up a bit. So I do think that Andrew Heaney has kind of pitched his way into the guy who's going to be voted off the starting rotation island into the bullpen. 877-881-1053. 877-881-1053, the number to call. Uh, and one thing I just want to quickly share as an example, when you have a starter who doesn't go deep, if you got one guy in your rotation who's kind of a two times through the order guy and you don't really feel great about anything beyond that, you can probably get by. You can't have too many of those guys because then it's going to unfairly tax your bullpen. But whether it's a starter who doesn't go deep or a reliever who doesn't finish an inning, it can have a domino effect. And I want to give you an example of, of that domino effect. So... Jose Urania facing the Astros for the third time in a little over a week. That's a lot of exposure. One of the reasons why relievers who don't necessarily have a ton of success as starters can have success out of the bullpen is because they don't expose themselves as much to opposing hitters as they do when they're a starter. When you overexpose a guy, you put him in a position, uh, not, I don't want to say to, to, to fail. Let me backtrack. You, you compromise one of the advantages that he might have. Now, it's not Bruce Bochy's fault, right? Who else was he going to turn to in this situation? But when guys aren't able to complete innings or complete assignments, you have to use an extra guy, or maybe you have to use a guy for more work than you would have liked. So yesterday, Brock Burke, unable to complete his assignment, you now have to dip into a little bit more of uh, of Grant Anderson. And now you got to end up going to David Robertson and Kirby Yates because it became a close game. And that can have a domino effect because who knows what uh, availability those guys had today. Uh, you know, I believe they were available, but, you know, it's, it's, it's now them having to pitch back to back days, which doesn't mean they're not going to be effective. But, you know, if I'm the Astros, I'll take my chances. Dane Dunning was fine yesterday. Five innings, three runs, he gave the team a chance to win. But by not being able to give the team a six inning, and I'm not blaming Dane, but just as an example, that's an extra inning of coverage that you need. And that's one less reliever who might be available the next game. And so all that stuff sometimes adds up. Sometimes it doesn't. All right? Let's say Dane Dunning gives you five. Yesterday plays out the way it, it did. Andrew Heaney gave you, you know, three and two-thirds today. And the Rangers' bats were able to, to strike against Ronel Blanco in the middle innings, and Jose Arena pitches well, then you're not, you know, it is what it is. It doesn't, it's not that it always has an impact, but those are some of the things that can impact baseball games beyond just what takes place over the nine innings of baseball in that particular day. Uh, anyway, let's get back to the phones. 877 881 1053. Joseph in Fort Worth's been waiting patiently. What's going on, Joseph? Hey, Jerry, how you doing today? Uh, I'm good, my man. What do you got for us? Uh, a little play that I wanted to have your take on. Uh, I believe it was in the uh, fourth inning when they scored the two runs, uh, Houston did. Uh, there was a play. Uh, we had a man on third, uh, nobody on first. Uh, John, uh, I think it was, it was a ground out, Marisa Dubon to Corey Seager. Uh, I was wondering why was your take on why why didn't he go to home uh, to try to get the uh, lead runner out? Uh, most of the most of the time when a play like that happens, you kind of look over the third to, to try to keep the runner from uh, going going home and try to keep the score uh, uh, at two zero at the time. And then uh, another another thing I want to take your take on why uh, why. Why bring in uh, Jacob Labs uh, when you have a left? Uh, a left uh, Andrew Heaney is a lefty. Uh, Jacob Labs is a lefty, so you're kind of not playing matchups there. Andrew Heaney had thrown 20, uh, 79 pitches. He probably could have gone maybe up to like maybe 
I don't know, 85, 90 pitches and try to get out of that inning and go on skate. I uh, just want to take uh, see what your take on that was. Joseph, are you still there? Can I ask you a cool question? Yes. Was Andrew Heaney pitching really well that inning? Yes, he he was. No, no, he, yeah, he wasn't. And and ba- he can give you eighty five to ninety pitches based on what? Because the Rangers, since they signed him, really haven't given, uh, haven't felt that comfortable pushing him to you know eighty five ninety pitches. That 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 is a good take. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll take that. But uh, at the same time, you kind of don't want to go into your bullpen that early. Yeah, but do you want to try and give yourself the best chance to win, or do you want to just throw Andrew Heaney out there when he's struggling and he's gotten his pitch count up? He's been laboring that inning and already hasn't been a good inning for him. I mean, it, it worked, right? Jacob Latz did the job, did he not? Yes, he did. And then uh, obviously, you're like you were saying, also uh, going. Uh, facing the same team three times in a row uh, when it comes to Urania, which Urania has been amazing so far. I'll give him credit to that. But uh, when you face a lineup three times and a lineup so so powerful as the Astros are, which, I mean, yeah, they're struggling right now, but that is a very powerful lineup that you got to face, especially when you got to face the top of the lineup. It's hard to go on skate the ones you face them three times. Yeah, but the, the issue is not – Going to Jacob Latz, I appreciate the call, Joseph. The issue is Andrew Heaney just didn't give Bruce Bochy much of a choice. You know, he had walked four guys. He had thrown around 80 pitches, 79 pitches, which is the Rangers pretty consistently cap him at around that point because they've got data uh, and experience that shows that he his production really begins to dip once he you know crosses that threshold. And uh, so I, I just – I. I don't think that there was any. Uh, I, I don't think there should be any question about going to the bullpen uh, at that time. You know, Jacob Jacob Latz has pitched well, and uh, you know Andrew Heaney was laboring. You know, he, he was he was struggling, and if you leave him in, and you know, it, bad stuff happens, then why didn't he go to the bullpen, right? So I I don't Andrew Heaney. This isn't a situation where like Andrew Heaney was pitching super well. And, you know, a manager's got the tough choice of a guy who's pitching super well but maybe running out of gas. Andrew Heaney wasn't pitching that well. And as far as the, the ground out, yeah, I, I don't know in that situation that you'd ever go home. You, you'd, first of all, didn't have the infield in. You were up by two runs, so there's no reason to have the infield in. Uh, and so Corey Seager gets the ground ball. He doesn't have a play at home. He can look at the runner at third all he wants, and that runner's going to, you know, smile at him over his left shoulder while he runs home. If you bring the infield in to try and cut out a run at home in that situation, you risk a, a big inning because as an, bringing the infield in does not make it easier for you to get outs. It makes it easier for you to get an out at home if a ball is hit at one of those infielders. But because you bring the infielders closer, it opens things up more for the hitter. And when you're up two to nothing in the fourth inning, you're not going to bring an infielder in. You want to just get the out. You know, you feel good. You got a good lineup. You feel good about the chance that Hey, I'm going to get the out, uh, and we'll go from you know go from there. Uh, so that's not a situation now. If it's later in the game and it's a one run game, you bring the infield in. Uh, but you're up by two runs, and the tying run is already on the bases, not the runner who scored, but another runner. You're not bringing the infield in in that situation, not at all. Uh, and so you're trying to prevent a big inning. Uh, you're not trying to. You're not trying to. You know be overly and unnecessarily aggressive. Uh, so Corey Seager wouldn't have had a play at the plate. Uh, and even if there's a small chance, if there's any doubt, you get the out. You take the out and you move on uh, in that situation. So that that's why it, it kind of played out that way. All right, let's go to Xavier in Arlington joining us here on Extra Innings. 877-881-1053. Hey, Xavier. Hey, Jared. Thanks for taking my call, man. You know, it's a, you know, over the course of a day, it's a long game. It's a nine inning game, not a four inning game. It's a 162 game season, not a 15 game season, right? So, uh, you know, I think what we can take out of these uh, first two series with the Astros is uh, uh, they're not going to go away. You know, they're they're a great major league baseball team, so they're not going to go away. They're, and the Rangers aren't going to win every matchup. 
Uh, what I wanted, to, and, and tough loss today. Well, I wanted to talk about Evan Carter's approach. You know, uh, I'm not taking away anything. Hey, great what he did uh, for the Rangers. Uh, you know, the end of last year, the playoffs, the World Series. But he's off to a you know tough start this season. He's getting his walks, and again, again, it's early, okay. But I want to talk about his approach at the plate with two strikes. You know, I've always, you know, uh, the, the game that I've always known is you got to protect the plate with two strikes. And I think sometimes I feel like uh, he's relying too much on, on you know, on, on himself uh, taking that pitch and getting called out on strikes. Uh, again, he's getting his walks and, and – you know, he may not be striking out all that much, but I've seen him several times already this season where he, he gets struck, you know, rung up looking on that second strike. And uh, uh, that's all I got. Jared, again, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, I think it's always frustrating to see a guy, again, I'm, I'm going to go to the data here. I think it's always frustrating to see a guy take a, a strike three looking, right? Uh, understand though, whether it's a full count or any two strike count, the odds are heavily against the hitter. And there is, whether you like it or not, there is a thought that has developed over the last few years that if you are in a full count situation and a pitcher is going to throw a pitch that is over the perimeter of the plate and not in an area in which you like to hit, that you take it and force the umpire to make the call. Because there's data that suggests that umpires are a little more reluctant to ring guys up in those situations. But let's let's go to the data quickly. All right. The major league average for on base percentage in two strike counts is 250. Evan Carter's on base percentage in two strike counts is 360. So I think, and I I, I think Xavier, first of all, Xavier's initial observation, it's a long season. Yes. The Astros are not going away. Yes, totally agree with both those. All right. And it goes both ways, right? It's a long season. The Rangers could still go. We don't know anything about it. I shouldn't say we don't know anything. We don't know that this is going to be a 95 win team. We don't know that it's, it's going to be a 85 win. You know, there's a lot of reason to believe that the Rangers are going to be a really good team, but things can obviously change. I mean, look at the angels last year at this time, they were, they were looking like a team that was going to contend for the AL West. The Mariners were looking like a team that had no business competing for a playoff spot, and both those roles totally flipped. Now, I, I don't think the Rangers are going to pull a 180 and you know just start trending downward by any means. Like I said, they're eight and seven, despite the fact that the only real player in their the only player in their lineup among their core guys who's maybe performing as you'd expect or or beyond what you'd expect is Adolis Garcia. No one else. And that's a credit to how good these guys are, but no one else is performing above realistic expectation. Maybe you get to Josh Smith, but I'm talking about you know the, the big names that we expect to, to carry the team. Uh, but as far as the two-strike thing, I think it's, it's one of those deals where I put it in the category of hitting with runners in scoring position. You have one bad game hitting with runners in scoring position, and everyone uh, you know runs to Twitter or the phones or the text line and says, oh, they can't hit with runners in scoring position. But then you look at the numbers, and maybe the numbers suggest otherwise. Maybe they don't. Evan Carter gets on base at a high rate in two-strike situations. It is more of a, a and I don't want to say an old-school thought process, because I, I don't want to say that it's not at all utilized today, but you know, it, there are hitters who used to say, I'd rather do fill-in-the-blank than strike out looking. Like, I'd rather do fill-in-the-blank really bad thing or have something bad happen to me than strike out looking. And I just don't think hitters have that same mindset these days and, and really good hitters, right? They just, Hey, a strikeout's a strikeout. And if, if, if you're throwing a perfect pitch on the corner and that strikeout with a Brayu on the mound, I mean, that was a really good breaking ball from a guy who doesn't typically throw his breaking ball for a strike. And that one just clipped the outside corner. It was a really good pitch from a Brayu. And unless you are absolutely thinking this is what he's going to do, that's a tough pitch to hit. And we know, I mean, one of the conversations yesterday was about the umpires. We know umps aren't perfect. But the odds of you getting a hit there are not great anyway. I mean, they're 
very small, that's a really, really good pitch. Now, the odds are better if you swing the bat. I get it. But the odds are better that you get on base by taking... Uh, my, my guess is, if you played that situation out 100 times, you would get on base more by taking that pitch than swinging at it. it if I had a guess. And that's the thought process. All that said, in that specific situation, could or should Evan Carter have swung at the pitch? It obviously didn't work out not swinging at it. But his two-strike approach has yielded an on-base percentage this year that's 100 points better than league average. So I think with Evan Carter, much like with Shin Su Chu, by the way, who's another high walk, high on-base guy, there are going to be times you're frustrated that he doesn't swing the bat. But that patience more often than not, gets rewarded in those situations relative to the rest of the league, if that makes sense. Josh and Sulphur Springs, you're on with us here. Extra innings brought to you by Uber Eats, bringing you home run deals all season long. Hey, Joshua. Hey, Jared. First of all, uh, you're doing an amazing job. So uh, I looked up some stats, and I don't know if a lot of fans know this or not. Um, I heard one caller say that uh, he's a little concerned with uh, our starting rotation uh, not going deep in the games. Uh, we're current, the Rangers are currently seventh right now in MLB with a 3.73 ERA. Uh, and yes, it's still early in the season. Um, but there's nothing really to worry about. Um, I think, I really think once we get Scherzer and DeGrom back, um, I think Heaney will, will move to the bullpen. Um, I just, I feel like that's, a really good fit for him there. Uh, speaking of the bullpen, yeah, you're absolutely correct. The bullpen this year compared to last year is it's not comparable. Um, we were atrocious last year. Um, Leclerc couldn't save a game to save his life. Um, has he pitched great this year? No, but it's still early. So hopefully he can get some of the kinks worked out uh, and he can start, you know, being the closer that, you know, he was, you know, two two years ago. Um, Nathaniel Lowe, when he comes back, um, yeah, you're right. He will be the everyday first baseman. Um, Josh Young's injury was unfortunate. But, I mean, we we'll, the, the Rangers have plenty of players coming off the bench to, you know, fill that void, just like last year when Seager got injured. Uh, you know, guys stepped up, and that was all it was to it. Um, it didn't really affect us any. Uh, that's pretty much all I got. Uh, thoughts on anything uh, as far as like the bullpen? Uh, where do you where do you see? Is it good? Bad? Uh, do you think Heaney in the bullpen would be a good fit? I, I think he is. Uh, thoughts on it? Uh, thanks. By the way, you're doing a great job. Hey, right, thanks, Josh. Yeah. I, so I think Andrew Heaney would be a good fit in the bullpen. I think you know Josh mentioned when Scherzer and Degrom, uh, DeGrom come back. I, I think Andrew Heaney ultimately goes to the bullpen uh, with Michael Lorenzen. Arriving now again, they're in this 17 game and 17 day stretch. I think Andrew Heaney might make one more start. I think the Rangers would love for Andrew Heaney to start against the Tigers on Thursday so that he doesn't have to face the lethal, uh, lethal Braves lineup, especially how good they are against lefties. Maybe he does go to the bullpen before that's possible. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if with Michael Lorenzen arriving in this 17 game and 17 day stretch, they basically plop him in and also use him as a way to give guys an extra day of rest by being a six starter this time through. But once the Rangers hit that off day, I, I, I'd be surprised if uh, Andrew Heaney wasn't the guy going to the bullpen. I don't think you need to wait for Scherzer for that. Uh, and with Jacob DeGrom, I mean, he's not returning until early August. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's way, way, way down the road for any sort of strategic decisions uh, to really come into play involving him at this point. Uh, as far as everything else, yeah, I mean, I, the hey, again, I'll I'll say two things. One, I don't think I, I think we are very quickly forgetting how bad last year's bullpen was, and so if there are any comparisons to last year's bullpen right now, though they are so far out of line. Last year's bullpen was one of the worst assembled bullpens ever. Uh, I shouldn't say assembled, worst performing bullpens ever. Uh, you know, when you consider their ability to convert close games into wins at the you know at the end. Uh, and this bullpen very well could head in a, a direction that points in the wrong way. But there's nothing about this bullpen thus far that remotely compares to last year's bullpen. Right. So I agree with with what Joshua was saying there. I mean, 
I'm not saying this is going to be a really good bullpen. I'm not saying it's going to be a lockdown bullpen. I think a lot remains to be seen. But this bullpen is just not in the same stratosphere as, as how last year's bullpen unfolded. It's just, they're not. Uh, so, you know, let's see what you get over the long run from Robertson and Yates. And can you get LeClerc going back in the right direction? And what happens when Spores comes back? And, you know, Jose Urania, not great today. Overall, he's been good. We're not going to crucify a guy for one bad outing, right? What are you going to get from Jose Arena? Does one bad outing turn into four bad outings in his last five appearances, or does one bad outing uh, look like the uh, you know the needle in the haystack? All right? There's a lot that you know we don't have enough of a sample size to know for sure. But I I kind of feel good about this bullpen being an average bullpen that has a chance to get better. Uh, with maybe guys like Urania being big-time contributors, with someone like Andrew Heaney going to the bullpen and being a contributor, and also with you know the the likelihood that if they're in it, they're going to make additions to the bullpen between now and the trade deadline. Uh, all right, that's going to do it for us. Appreciate the call. It's always a great conversation, uh, and at the end of the day, should be looking forward to tomorrow. Sunday Masters, you got the last regular season NBA day, uh, the Mavs aren't really playing for anything, but around the league, there's some exciting stuff. But obviously, most importantly, rubber game, Rangers-Astros, Evaldi and Javier. Really, really good pitching matchup. Really good pitching matchup. Uh, coverage begins uh, at 1230. First pitch just past 1 o'clock. So be sure to turn the dial to 105.3 on the FM side. That's going to do it for us, for Chris Strong and Justin Honore. For Matt Hicks and the voice of the Rangers, Eric Nadell, Jared Sandler, thanking you for joining us today and this evening. The Rangers fall to the Astros 9-2. Back with you tomorrow. 12.30 pregame coverage starts. Rangers and Astros, the rubber game on your home of the Rangers, 105.3 The Fan. Close. Join us for extra innings after every game on 105.3 The Fan. And give a shout out to Uber Eats for teaming up with us and delivering home run deals to you and your family all season long. Check out their all-star lineup of restaurants. The best selection you'll find on the Uber Eats app. You'll score a win every time you order when you take advantage of the many offers available from their partner restaurants. Download the Uber Eats app and make them a part of your game.